Okay, everybody. Unfortunately, we have to start. Uh, last, the people they get in food to be paying attention while they get in food. Ross. Um, so we're going to start because it's uh, 15 minutes past the hour, and he has uh, 150 slides to go through. <laughs> we got to get to. Couple of announcements. Uh, today he's going to be talking. Last week, actually. Uh, let's start from this week. He's going to be talking about how social, how to use social media, how to become better human beings, and all this stuff. Next week. When we settle that, we have Raul Jimenez from Barcelona. He's going to tell us how to understand the universe. So we have many more, more talks coming, exciting talks. So we'll see you again. Uh, that we'll see you again after Raul, which is next week, two weeks later. So it's my pleasure to introduce Johan. We have a very pleasant dinner yesterday with very animated discussions, so I know a little more about him now. Uh, he's an associate professor at Indiana University School of Informatics. Uh, he was before at Los Alamos University, and for three years he was uh, the computer science in Old Dominion University in Virginia. His PhD though, is in psychology uh, from Brussels. He got it in 2001. He has published a lot of papers, but there's some interesting stuff about Johan, which I didn't know, that he's actually a DJ. Yeah. And uh, he said at the end of the lecture, he's going to do some dance DJ for us. <laughs> no, you're going to do dance. Yeah, he's going to be there. He's actually DJing at clubs in Bloomington. I didn't know there are clubs in Bloomington. <laughs> Apparently, they are. Uh, so since we're late, I'll let you start. Sure. Thank you very yeah. much. OK, my mic, my, is my mic on? Can everybody hear me? OK, good. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, you know, I've, 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 I've never actually spoken to an audience that was so busy, with, uh, the, the, so involved in the act of digestion. Uh, but <laughs> if you could just keep the, uh, the food noises down a little bit, that would be great. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, so I, I, one correction, it was a Los Alamos National Laboratory, not university. So it's not an accredited university. It's a national laboratory, and it, and it is a nuclear weapons lab. Uh, but I was not involved in the creation of any, of any bombing materials or nuclear materials because I'm, uh, my, uh, I'm originally from Belgium, and uh, so I wasn't a naturalized citizen when I got there, and so they wouldn't allow you what they called behind the fence. You were supposed to work in sort of areas where foreigners would be tolerated. Uh, and um, anyway, it's a really interesting time. And uh, I, was, I was planning to start my talk with a little bit of an anecdote because sort of the, the germ of this idea is uh, uh, the germ of this idea is kind of connected to the work that I did at Los Alamos National Laboratory and also some of the people that I know here uh, locally, including Alberto Pepe. The, the, a lot of people here in the audience know quite, quite well, it seems. And so we're, we're driving around in our car and he tells me he's got, a, he's got a, uh, an email archive. It's got a bunch of emails, right? And this is, this is Los Alamos National Laboratory. So you go, ooh, emails, you know. Um, I immediately get into spy mode. What, what could we learn from an archive of emails, a large archive of emails? But this was a special archive of emails in the sense that there were emails that were dated. And people would send them to themselves in the future. So little time capsules. So really smarmy stuff like, have you married the girl that you love? You know, those kind of things. And they would, they would address them to themselves like, 15 or 20 years into the future. And at that point, it was 2009, I had just purchased a home in, in Santa Fe, and the, the loan office I was talking to had to, told me that the yield curve had inverted. And, and, and so she, 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 her uh, eyebrows went up and down like that, which indicated that I should know what that meant. And um, what it meant is that, that they, they were expecting some ec economic calamity. And she was essentially, essentially telling me, I think, not to buy that house and get a, more, and get a really expensive mortgage. Um, and so that, that kind of inspired me that there were some kind of animal spirits involved in all of this, right? There, there was some collective wisdom taking place where investors collectively were looking at sort of a, a variety of signals and were essentially just assessing that future risk versus uh, for, for sort of risk of, uh, of long-term investments versus short-term investments were uh, inverted at that point in time. So, uh, so we started analyzing these, these emails by year. To, by the year at which they were addressed. And my background in psychology, I've always been very interested in extracting uh, sentiment and mood from, from, from text, 
Now, people actually tell, often tell you how they're, they're feeling, right? And so we did this analysis, and what we found is indeed that we, did, we found some kind of an inverted yield curve in that data as well. It wasn't very reliable because it didn't have enough data, but it, it felt like we were tapping into sort of the animal spirits that were, that were guiding the market from something as trivial as, as, as an email service where people could send emails uh, uh, to themselves in the future. And so that got this, this, the, the, this research effort started. So as soon as I got to Indiana University, I put a few students on uh, this analysis. And the, 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 the basic object of what we were trying to do, and this is where the computational social science comes into the picture, not just computational science, but computational social science. And we had a question, do societies experience mood states? So as, as, as a, just like individuals do. So when I get up in the morning, I'm a little cranky, I have that first espresso, I perk up a little bit, and then, and then I'm on, and then you know, it's, it's, you know, I keep going until uh, some point in the night. Um, do societies have that as well? I mean, as a, as, a, as a collection, not just, just as a sum of individuals. And if so, can we actually assess such mood states and determine whether they have any particular validity, whether it's just animal spirits in the ether, you know, that they, they, you know, perhaps we can measure something, uh, but it has no validity with respect to real stuff like ac economic production and, and, and the financial markets, etc. So can we assess their, uh, can we determine their socioeconomic correlates? So uh, mo most of you must have heard about some of this old psychological Research, right? Most people in the world will recognize these faces, these facial expressions, right? And we'll be able to, to interpret them correctly. And so a lot of the sort of the, the emotional capabilities that we have in terms of interpreting the emotions of others and reading them are uh, very often thought to be hardwired into, into the brain, right? And um, clearly the question then is whether societies as a whole have s similar mood states, right? Can, can, for example, can a society be, be sad? Can a society be angry, upset, disgusted, etc.? For example, I mean, you look, this is a really angry crowd. If you, if you look at their faces, in, in, I mean, I think this guy's really, really mad about the prospect of getting free health care only in the U.S. Um, so <laughs> why do we care? Why do we care about, 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 uh, uh, about society, mood states, sort of the collective mood state of society? Why? Well, because... You know, motion, even though we, we, a lot of people won't admit it, but plays an, an, an enormously important role in human decision making. Right? This is true for traders. It's been shown, for example, if traders feel good, if they, they have a good day, they're a little more prone to, uh, uh, to go long versus short. You know, it, it plays, uh, you know, and it's true that they've actually been able to show that, that traders actually, depending on their, their sentiment, uh, make decisions. So that they're not sort of the, the rational machines that, um, uh, that, that a lot of uh, economic theory uh, and, and, and theory in finance presumes they are, but this is true for all of us in many ways. And then the question, of course, becomes that if we look at large-scale societal decision-making like elections, um, etc., do these kind of uh, collective mood states play a role there as well? And again, we, we've seen many, I can identify many cases where that's the case. I mean, right now there's a, a huge crisis taking place in, in, in the Ukraine. Uh, you know, emotions there are flaring up. A lot of the decision making there collectively of people, for example, voting to split off from Ukraine and join Russia, etc. And I even know whether that, that those results have been confirmed yet. But a lot of, the, the, uh, you know, there's a lot of emotionality in these kind of questions. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, myself, I come from Belgium, which is a country that has three national languages. Languages and as three regions uh, and, and, and as many communities, and they overlap in non-trivial ways. Uh, and you can imagine that once you start talking about people's language, language and ethnic origins, etc., people can get very, very upset about things. Right? Uh, the Again, the financial markets, to, to, to some degree, might be driven by, by panics and mood. Uh, sometimes, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, even though very often when we think about angry crowds, we think about very unproductive ways in which collective mood states uh, impinge on our, our thinking. But if, I, if you look, for example, at the Haiti uh, disaster, uh, a lot of the uh, humanitarian response to that disaster was essentially modulated by social media. And I've, I've, we've had a, I've had a really interesting uh, discussion with Pavlos about this because I, I'm, in, I, I'm perhaps over beer we can talk about this. But I think that the you, you cannot hate people that you're exposed to, that you that, that, that you're exp whose daily lives and whose travails etc. You're exposed to on a daily basis. And I think that that as a society we've be, we've become kinder. Um, um, well, I, at least that's my hope. Uh, again, as a DJ, I know very well that you know when you have a crowd going, it's it's a force to behold. <laughs> I mean, you can, sometimes you can make them very happy. People are j jumping up and down on the tables. Sometimes you can make them a little 
uh, more thoughtful. Uh, you can drive it, right? And you, you can see that this even applies to leaders. And of course, shopping, uh, you know, marketing, branding, and consumption to a large degree is driven by emotion, right? Um, I have to tell you. So, why do, again, why do we care? Um, I think a lot of people, again, when they think about crowd psychology and crowd moods, they have this idea in mind. They're just a bunch of mindless zombies, a bunch of mindless lemmings that are plunging into the abyss, right? So the, the, the focus there is mostly on, on sort of negativity. And then you have, the, I found this drawing here, talk about techno-optimism. I don't know whether this is an optimistic view of the future or not. Uh, in French it says, en l'an 2000, in the year 2000, and the, the vision of telecommunication those days, is there's a teacher pouring books into a machine, that poor boy turning, cranking the wheel, and then the knowledge being imparted upon all of this. But I, but I think that my view is a little more sort of, sort of in, in between these two extremes. <laughs> Actually, the, the, the name of that image I found it yesterday evening online, I wanted to share it with you, is the, uh, uh, the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> it's the title of this image. Well, anyway, so clearly we're, we're, th th this kind of top-down scenario hasn't played out. I, I don't think that this kind of bottom-up scenario <laughs> is playing out. I think what we're having is a little bit of this, where you've got large groups of, of very well-connected individuals that are sharing sort of the final points of their emotional mood states, and out comes some kind of an aggregate, which we call the collective mood state. Okay, well, this is an hypothesis. I'm not saying that's really happening. That's the, that's the point of doing this research at all. Okay, so people have done a lot of research on measuring collective happiness, because uh, funny enough, a lot of us care about whether other people are happy. I do, right? Uh, I mean, if you would get really mad at me over this lecture, that I would care very much about that. In fact, uh, I, I don't want to end up in a torches and, um, and pitchfork scenario here. Uh, people really care about quality of life, general happiness, contentment, etc., uh, which is which is very different from um, sort of more conditional mood states, like how we're feeling about X. You know, I drank a Coca Cola, a glass of Coca Cola, and now I'm happy about Coca Cola because I like the taste of it. That's sort of conditional sentiment. It's opinion, right? But what we're referring to is mood, which is a little different, which is more disconnected from sort of uh, uh, topics and behaviors like that. Um, very, I mean, again, perhaps we'll discuss it over beers afterwards, but uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to achieve some kind of sort of Golton's. How, how many of you know about Golton's fat ox? Can you just see? No one? You do. No one here knows about Galton's fat ox. Okay, good. So, uh, quickly, this is um, a, a paper that Galton published in, in Nature in the year 1907, where he went to a market, and essentially they were selling off raffle tickets to win a fat ox. But to win the fat ox, you had to actually estimate the weight of the ox. And if your estimate came closest to the actual weight of the ox, you'd win. And so, of course, Galton, being a statistician, collected all of the estimates and found out that if you just uh, uh, calculate the mean of all of these estimates, you would come closer to the actual weight of the fat ox than any of the individual estimators. So well, I, I'm, I'm telling you this because I'm thinking that what we're tap, trying to tap into sort of the emotional variant of Galton's fat ox, so to speak, right? We all make evaluations of our, how our life is go, are going. You aggregate the whole and you end up with some of collective estimation of whether things suck or whether they don't. Uh, that, that might be more accurate than any, any uh, of us individually could estimate. Okay, so that's sort of the general reasoning behind these national level happiness studies. I know uh, how many of you have seen this kind of research, but this is essentially where they call people all over the world and ask them this one question. All things considered, how satisfied are you with life as a whole these days? On a scale from zero to 10. Now you can, add, some of these questionnaires are much more complex. But the truth is that if you perform like a, a sort of a factor analysis on them, you'd, you'd find that there's one sort of a big principal component that explains a lot of the variances and it's essentially just your happiness, subjective well-being, if you will. So you can produce these maps and it turns out that people in the United States and Canada are very happy. Uh, the Spanish are very happy. The Scandinavians are really cool. The French are a little more sour. We, we talked about that last night. Uh, that might be a cultural. That might be a cultural phenomenon. That might be a cultural phenomenon because I, I think the. Uh, I'm, I'm originally from Belgium myself, and pe people connect by complaining. Uh, the, 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 it's 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 a, it's a culturally acceptable accepted norm. And if you don't complain along, you, you're 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 a joy kill. It's it's you, you can't have friends. Um, and the funny thing is I, I overheard a Dutch couple walking across campus and so I understood what they were saying and, and none of it was kind. It was all like, roads suck, I can't believe it, these cobblestones, ah, the walls are dirty. You know? <laughs> <laughs> 
not impressed with Harvard. Uh, so the, the people I've done actually surveys where essentially they're t trying to tap into sort of a collective sense of well-being as well. I, I really like this one here, although a, a, a colleague of mine was really mad about Portugal not being... Uh, uh, and, and misrepresented, and you know, cultural differences really do play a role in how people respond to these queries. I mean, I, I don't know whether you've seen this, it was actually published in The uh, Economist, and where they, they essentially did a, a principal component analysis, if you will, and they, uh, the main dimension is survival values versus self-expression values, that's the X, and the Y is uh, traditional values versus sort of secular rational values. And you can see that the Scandinavian countries are in the top left because they, they have highly secular values that have, and, and still have a, a, they're very strongly focused on self-expression. And the U.S., I think, is in the corner here somewhere. It's a very traditional society that is very strongly focused on self-expression. And that kind of rings true uh, uh, for me. Um, now, okay, so that's, the, that's the, sort of the, that, that, that's how people used to sort of tap into the, the zombie collective consciousness, if you will. Right? by making phone calls and asking queries. But I, I, I know a lot of you are on Twitter and Facebook right now, so I don't have to make this little, <laughs> have to make this little I, I could see you laugh, right? Uh, sometimes they project the Twitter feed while I'm talking. It's a very scary thing. Uh, but seriously, Facebook right now has about 850 million users, I think. That's, that's like two, more than two times the population of the United States. Uh, YouTube is 800 million users, Twitter is 500 million users. You know, if you, I mean, I sometimes joke that if you put all of these social media users together, you, you have a, a, a seventh of the world's population. It would be the, the biggest nation on earth, right? I mean, if it were a nation, it would have an army and it would be invading oil-producing uh, countries. Okay, so what does that do for us? What does that do for us, right? And we had a really nice discussion of, of just before lunch about this. It, it really revolutionizes our ability to tap into that global consciousness because people, every single one of these individuals is essentially acting like a human censor, right? All of you that are on Twitter and Facebook right now saying this talk sucks, you know, you're going you know, to tar and feather bowling after this presentation, you know, you're really a little censor that's in this room and reporting to the rest of the world voluntarily. They're not, paying, they're not even paying you for this. I mean, think about this. They've tricked you into generating the content that they own for them. And it's a fantastic business model, right? But every one of you is functioning like a little sensor reporting on conditions, like this sucks, it's too cold in this room, it's too warm, the weather is not nice, I just lost my job, those kind of things, right? And so when you put it all together, what you have is you know, a, a sort of a huge stigmergic memory in these social media and, 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 and environments, right, that we're all contributing to. And it's really revolutionizing, I think, social science. A lot of people uh, refer to it as computational social, social science right now, and uh, that, that's where I kind of situate my, my own research. Katie, uh, uh, Kati Berner, who's at, um, uh, at Indiana University as well, has referred to this notion of social microscopes. And um, sort of this is, uh, the information that's volunteered by all of these people allows us to study very complex uh, social uh, interactions and conditions in, in, in real time using very large scale databases. I mean, for example, with uh, Twitter, they've got 500 million users. A lot of these users submit at least one tweet per day. So you can imagine every day you've got uh, uh, 500 million, 800 million tweets. Right? You multiply that by 365 days, and this rolls along 24 7. Right? There's an earthquake, the actual the tweets travel ahead of the earthquake faster than the earthquake waves themselves. You can imagine what kind of data that we're able to tap into now. Uh, the, of course, there's limitations, right? People choose what they report on. So you're really driven by the, the Vox populi, and a lot of people don't like that very much. Uh, but still, people can pack a lot of meaning into these, these 140 characters uh, on Twitter, for example. Asian languages, by the way, are at a huge advantage because of the, uh, of the way that they write. As you've got 140 characters. I mean, it's nearly a book in, uh, in Mandarin. <laughs> right? uh, we're not that fortunate because we have to actually spell out the, uh, phonetically the, uh, the, the words. Uh, but yeah, here's an example. This is, the, uh, this is the U.S. Declaration of Independence in a tweet. All right, so I'm not going to... Uh, anyway, I think it's a, it's a pretty good overview of how the, <laughs> how the revolutionaries would have addressed George III. <laughs> I thought this was such a beautiful... It had a contest. Um, 
Anyway, but people pack a lot of into do. Here's Miriam Brake that I used to work with in Los Alamos. It's snowing. I love winter's white beauty juxtaposed with fireplace warmth. Right? A lot of information there. She's telling us what conditions in Santa Fe are right, uh, like right now, if we can just tap into that. So that's what we've been uh, working on. And there's a whole community of researchers right now that is focused on, on uh, leveraging, leveraging this kind of data to do a whole bunch of things. Like Asura in 2010 uh, looked at Twitter chatter. And these are just the frequency of mentions of movie titles. They did a sentiment analysis as well uh, to predict box office receipts, which stands to reason, right? A lot of people are talking about movies. They might actually go and see them. They talk about them. Right? Hopefully, they're not talking about how much the movie sucked after they've seen it. So it's a little bit tricky. Uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated right now by sort of this notion of verbal autopsies, where people actually report symptoms. And then you try to map that into uh, sort of diagnostic criteria for a variety of diseases. You can actually uh, look at drug interactions online. For example, someone could tell you I took a Valium, and then I drank a bottle of scotch, and I'm not feeling so well. Right? That will tell you something about the interaction between these different drugs. And again, you've got 800 million people performing these experiments in real time and reporting on them uh, voluntarily. A lot of research has gone into predicting consumer behavior from search query volumes. We've done a little bit of that as well. I'll talk a lot about that a little. So that's when you look at Google queries and you chart how many queries, for example, pertain to cars or, uh, or uh, stereos or uh, you know, the, the DJ controllers, what have you. Uh, in our own work, we've actually also looked at predicting elections. And in one of our latest paper, papers, we showed that if you take the US congressional districts and you geolocate tweets and you look at just basic name mentions of candidates, the candidates are, that are uh, uh, named the most or mentioned the most tend to win the election. And the, the predictive value is very, very high. I think we achieved an accuracy of about 92, 94%. <coughs> I'm, I'm working from memory here, so don't, so don't use that number as a, in your tweets just yet. Um, the, the, the kind of research that I'm also very interested in is sort of, a, a sort of contagion effects of loneliness and happiness because that's where we get into collective mood. Right? An earthquake happens, it makes us sad, then the collective mood state is sadness, but that's not really endogenous mood. That's mood that, that's sort of controlled in a top-down manner. An earthquake is bad, it makes us all feel bad. That's not really collective mood. What I'm interested in is sort of how moods percolate through these societies, like, uh, like the flu, right? like, like an epidemic uh, mood. So, how, how is that done? Just to give you sort of, a, I, 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 unfor I mean, I can't go into all of this because I'd be teaching a class on sentiment analysis before you know it and I'd run out of time and you all get really bored. Uh, but there's many, many techniques to extract an indication of sentiment or mood from text. People have been using machine learning algorithms for as long as I, I, I can remember. Um, there's some pretty innovative uh, approaches using uh, sort of engrams, right? You're trying to capture sort of uh, grammatical uh, uh, structures like negation, etc. cetera. Um, uh, support vector machines have been used a lot. You know, you've got a training set and you're trying to carve that, that hyperspace such that you put all of the negative and the positive tweets on, 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 on one end, right? Uh, very common is just using a naive Bayesian classifier. You train it with tweets that have been labeled positive, negative, and it looks for the features that have the highest value in predicting whether uh, the next tweet is positive or negative. Uh, and then you've got the lexicons. And the lexicons, we, we've used that a lot as well. And very often, very often these lexicons have actually been evaluated. This is psychology, of course, but you, you give people a list of words. Like, they just say, I've got a thousand words in the English language. I put you in a room, and you rate these words, whether they're, they're happy or sad words. OK? Now, it's, it's a sort of a typical thing that psychologists would do. So you have all of these words, and they're labeled ne positive and negative. And then you look at the tweet, you look at all of the words in that tweet, and you add up all of the positive negative values, and you get like sort of an average emotional value for that tweet. That's sort of the lexicon-based approach. Um, the lexicons available, you've got the annuity effective norms for English words. Uh, uh, Dodds has actually done some really interesting research there. There's a whole bunch of approaches that use lexicons. Nice thing about lexicons is, one, you don't have to train them, right? And, and all it takes is just simply looking at the words in a, in a tweet and adding up all of the emotional values. The big disadvantage is that it's essentially a unigram method, which means that negation, et cetera, et cetera, is not taken into account. And um, you're not really rating the mood state or the sentiment of the author, but of the actual piece of language. So if I would, for example, tell you that I sell my love for money, is that a happy tweet or a sad tweet? <laughs> that, 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 yeah, I, I think that would be a sad tweet, right? But these, these lexicons will look at, look at love, money, and sell, and body, and go... 
Okay, so it's this. This is uh, none of this is rocket science, really. It's very straightforward, and th th there's been lots and lots of commercial applications. I'm showing a screenshot here. D take a whole bunch of tweets, classified and positive, negative, add it all up, and uh, so this is. I mean, I think this domain is crystallized to the point that we've got a whole set of uh, techniques right now that have reasonable accuracy. I should also mention, by the way, the Stanford, the Stanford Core NLP. They have a sentiment module that I think is pretty sophisticated because it actually generates a parse tree of the sentence and then uses that to recombine all of the, uh, the, uh, the effective distributions associated with the terms in that sentence. I think it's really nice and it's fast to program in Java you can download it and use it. Um, okay, so, so those are just individual tweets that are really difficult to classify, but of course people have been, as I mentioned, been classifying large bunches of tweets, aggregating the uh, sentiment values for those tweets, and then producing, the, the, uh, if you look at, this was published in Science, um, I think this is really interesting research, but it looked at diurnal rhythms in collective mood states over time, right? So they, they looked at a day, the day is 24 hours, that's at the x-axis, right? And what they show, and this is very anti-intuitive for me, because, you see, this is 3 a.m., and that's when my, usually my DJ sit, set hits its peak, and I would not have a slump in emotion at that particular point in time. No, I'm a night owl. I'm a horrible night owl. And I cannot imagine my sentiment perking up much at 8 a.m. But throughout the world, this is the pattern. People go to sleep, right? They, they start to wake up. Their mood improves. And they go to work. And <laughs> <laughs> et cetera. But this is really interesting research, right? Because it shows you that, that across cultures, people, people collectively undergoing these diurnal rhythms these sleep wake cycles, not just sleep wake cycles, but cycles of mood. So essentially, it's just a, a way of aggregating individual sentiment as you discovered in tweets in a particular location and then uh, uh, going on. So let me, let me give you sort of two cases where we, we applied sort of, I've, I've given you sort of a very wishy washy overview of how this is done. Right? At least you have some pointers, and I'll go into two cases where we've applied this research uh, to study both sort of the, I would say the transmission, but at least homophily in social mood homophily in social networks, and uh, 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 financial market prediction. Okay? Uh, don't expect any stock tips from me, but uh, if you buy me beers, you might get lucky. Uh, okay, Twitter data. So the, uh, the, the data for this analysis, and this is really focused on studying whether people's mood states on Twitter are shaped by their uh, 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 social connections, okay? So we took a, a mood set, uh, November 20, 2008 to May 29, 2009. That's a long time ago. And so only 129 million tweets, right? So if we, we would have done this right now, we would have a, you know, billions of tweets. But it's, it, it, that's the, the, the set that we used also because it was nicely labeled. And we had the entire social network of the people who submitted these tweets available, okay? So the data looks exactly, for those of you who haven't actually tapped into the API, uh, the Twitter API, you know, the, the stream that you get is, essentially looks like this. The, the, every tweet has an idea, it has a date time of submission, the type of submission, and then the text of the tweet, and then a, a few other uh, uh, elements that are listed in the user profile, okay? So we took, the first thing that we did is we, for that data set, we looked at all of the users that we found in the data set, because got, they've got unique user handles. Right? Now, I will say this though, we don't know whether a user has set up 20 user handles or not, right? but we're, we're assuming that every handle, every user identified that we have actually corresponds to an individual. Okay, and now we're going to determine which of these people are friends. The, the, main th the one thing I wanted to stress is it's one of my pet peeves is that Twitter is not a social network. It, it really isn't a social network. It's a news propagation network. To be a social network, you know, if, if I know Michael and he doesn't know me, I like Michael, but he doesn't like me, that's not a social relationship. We're not friends at that point, right? I mean, Britney Spears might have 50,000 followers, but unless she's friends with all of her 50,000 followers, it's not really a social relationship. It's more of a following relationship. It indicated whatever Britney says, I want to see that. That's not much, much of a social relationship. Okay, so we... So we have to work with the data that we have, which is often the case in data science. Is there a question? Yeah. Sure. So you're saying it's an undirected network, but then in your explanation of Twitter, it seemed like you were talking about a directed network. So I'm just wondering. Where does it say undirected? On the top. Oh, yeah. No, what I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it is an undirected. It says that we create an under, uh, undirected network. I'm sorry, the language is a little confusing. But thank you for, for explaining that. Yes. So, um, so to us. A friend is when A follows B and B follows A. 
So it's a definition. So we're creating an undirected network by using it reciprocal following links. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll fix the slide. Um, now, the other, the, other, uh, uh, the other thing that we did is we, we, we ensured that we had sufficient tweet coverage by eliminating uh, uh, all individuals that did not post, that posted less uh, than uh, or equal to one tweet per day on average. Okay? Then, once we had all of these reciprocal following links and we had an undirected network, we calculated an edge weight. And the dead edge weight is very simple, sort of the Jacquard index, where we look at the overlap between the friends that we have in that network. Right? So, for example, if Michael and I have, this, have you know, 90 percent of our friends overlap, we have a very hard, and we have a very high um, uh, uh, degree of uh, friendship between the two of us associated with that edge. Okay? So, um, we only look at a sort of a, neighbor, a neighborhood of one, which means that we're not looking at sort of secondary relationships. It's only within that particular neighborhood. And so what we have at that point is an undirected network with weighted edges. And the weights are the Jacquard indices of our uh, 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 friends. So it's a, I don't have to explain this, but this is more or less how it works. Right? Okay, so what we end up with is not this network. That's one of those uh, hairball kind of graphs. It's just for illustration. But we ended up with a network of about 100,000 users. So imagine as, for a psychologist to have a social network of 100,000 users. That's already huge, right? And it's only a, it's sort of a sliver of the, of, of, of the social network that you could extract from the network of Twitter followers. And about 7.5 million edges weighted by that Jakarta index. Okay? So we have that network. The, the, the edge weight and the degree distributions follow sort of the patterns that you would expect from all social networks, namely that some people have lots and lots of friends, and then most people have very few friends, right? This is on a log scale. Right, so it's a, a typical thing that we use. Okay, now, now we did the following. For every single one of those users, we collected their subjective well-being. How did we do that? We tracked them for six months. Right now, this data set for most of these users and, and a whole bunch of others, we have three years of longitudinal data. We have every single tweet that they submitted where we essentially have a record of their daily lives for about three years, recorded in their tweets. But in this case, we had only six months. And what we did is we uh, applied a, uh, a simple lexicon method to each of these tweets and classified them as positive or negative. Okay? And then what we do is we calculate the subjective well-being as simply the ratio of positive versus negative tweets in that user's timeline. So if that user over the, that six-month period mostly submitted positive tweets, we, 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 we deem the subjective well-being of that user to be high. If they submitted mostly negative tweets, we deem the subjective well-being of that user to be mostly low. Make sense? Okay. But only for users who at least tweet one tweet per day on average. Otherwise, we don't have enough coverage in that timeline. Okay. We used Opinion Finder to do this. Uh, we, it, 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 to be more precise, we used the lexicon of Opinion Finder to do this, which has 2,718 positive and 4,912 negative words. And essentially, we just counted the number of positive and negative words per tweet and then updated our assessment of that, that, that tweet. Okay, makes sense. Okay, so here's some examples of happy users. And remember, this is, these numbers are over six months. So you can imagine how, what some of these users posted over that six month period. So uh, subjective well being higher than 0 0.5. You know, you've got people, nothing quite feels like a good shower, shaven haircut, love it, my beautiful friend, I love you. I mean, just really beautiful stuff, right? And these are, these are clearly happy users, right? So it has fa face validity. You know, that's something very important, by the way. I always tell my students, you know, eyeball the results. If they, if they don't make sense, you know, either you discovered something groundbreaking but most, or most likely you made a mistake. Subjective well-being users of less than zero, so you see a little bit of a Pollyanna effect here, right? Uh, if you score less than zero in English on the subjective well-being test that we had, you're in bad trouble. You know, if someone's complaining his headphones are electrocuting him, I'm almost getting, some of this stuff is really tragic, by the way. You really wonder why people post this stuff online. Um, no, really, I, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, what is that? So you can observe. So I can observe it. Thank you, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, in, yeah. In the, in the name of old scientists, thank you, Twitter. Thank you, Twitter community. Um, okay, so the subjective well-being distributions that we found, I think uh, in and of itself, this distribution is pretty uh, revealing. So you get the CDF on one end and the, uh, uh, the cumulative distribution on one end, and on the left you have the regular distribution. So what you see is that it's centered around zero, right? You've got a big spike around zero. That's where all of the negative users are. And then you've got another sort of, it's a bimodal distribution. We've got another spike at around 0 0.25, and those are the happy users. So it's pretty compressed, right? 
So that's just us norming our instruments, so to speak. But you can clearly see that at least in English, and that's what, what do you know about the Pollyanna effect? Yeah. No, I just wanted to know why the distribution isn't symmetric around zero, or why the negative choosers aren't negative SOV, SLEV? Yeah, we don't know. Are you asking why that is? Yeah, or I mean, is that a problem of the definition, or is that just how users are? Yeah, so that's a little. That's a good question here because we don't know how much of this is an artifact of the measuring instrument. If you if you saw looked at the opinion finder, it has more negative than positive words. But I, I think that should mean that the overall negative, uh, sort of the, the the overall distribution should be shifted towards the negative end rather than being shifted to the positive end like this. And, I, and that's why I was referring to the Pollyanna hypothesis. It's a very well known effect in, in linguistics and natural language processing that people prefer to talk about positive things. So if you analyze language, there will be a very strong bias towards positive subjects and positive evaluations. It's called the Pollyanna hypothesis. Of course, if you do this for France, then it might be a different <laughs> I don't know why I'm picking other French. Anyway, so, uh, but yeah, you can clearly see that, there's, that, that it's somewhat of a, a bimodal distribution. I think that the, the, there's the, the relatively high number of zeros here simply might simply indicate that we have no signal. That's just a neutral tweet. Uh, okay, now let's talk a little bit about assortativity versus disassortativity. This is something that network scientists care about a lot. And it's essentially a, sort of a version of the, uh, of the notion that uh, uh, birds of a feather, you know, mixed together. Is that, is that the expression? Right? So people have observed this quite a bit for degree in, in social networks. Funny enough, people that have a lot of friends tend to hang out with people that have a lot of friends. <laughs> That's assortativity. But assortativity, of course, can be observed for a variety of different things, not just degree, but also other uh, features. People like to hang out with people who are like them. I, perhaps I, you know, I, I, I'm not like that at all. I like to hang out with people who are different from me, because if I hang out with just a bunch of Johann Boland clones, I mean, things get very, very boring very quickly. Uh, but most people like to hang out with people who are like them on the basis of uh, religion, uh, ethnicity, language, etc. So in these kind of social net networks, you often see sort of high degrees of assortativity when, uh, when the connections are being established on, uh, uh, are, are at least influenced by the, the features of the nodes. But very often in control networks, you have disassortativity. Right? Your boss is designed to be very much not like you because he's bossing you around. So in those kind of networks, you will see that this kind of degree assortativity and, 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 and the homophilic properties of networks aren't quite as strong. Right? So here's a sort of a really dis, a strongly disassortative network. Uh, since most people, right, uh, and I, I don't mean any normative statement, most, most people are heterosexual. So if you had a dating network, a dating network where you color the, the girls pink and the boys blue, then you would very often see pink dots connected to blue dots, right? And in, 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 in very many cases, but not, not all cases, you, you'd sometimes see blue dots connected to blue dots and pink dots connected to other pink dots, right? So in this network, this is a dating network. And you could please, for example, here's two blue dots, see? But both of them are connected to pink dots. And uh, just, a, just a little bit of self-deprecation here. <laughs> At least not in high school. OK, so, so just to show you that this kind of assortativity, this assortativity can be observed for both. Uh, for, for, it doesn't have to be focused on degree. This, uh, sort of the, the degree of a node can be based on any of the features, for example, language or sex, et cetera. And the way that we measure assortativity, I mean, there's many ways to measure it, but one of the, reasons, one of the ways that we did it is what we defined pairwise and neighborhood assortativity. Pairwise assortativity is essentially where you take all of the edges in the network and look at the source and the target, you look at the and you, and you, and you end up with two vectors of, of the features of, representing the features of those nodes, and then you correlate the two vectors. Make sense? So every edge in the network, you take the source and the target, you take their features, line them up, and calculate a, a correlation. The neighborhood assortativity that we define is just a way of seeing how people tend to uh, be in clusters of people that are like them, is that we took a node. I mean, I've, I've, got, I've got some fake math here for you. I mean, not, perhaps I shouldn't go into it. But we would t essentially take the, uh, like this, we take every node, every user in the network, and we look at the community that surrounds them at a distance of one. Of one edge, and then we calculate, take their subjective well-being and calculate an average. And then we can take the node's subjective well-being and the average of the people that surround them and correlate those two. Make sense? Oh, OK, good. Um, and this is what we found. And honestly, I was really surprised by these results. I was really surprised because I didn't think that mood or subjective well-being would 
display these high levels of assortativity or uh, homophily, if you will. Right? So we, we, we applied uh, the threshold to the edges based on the, uh, uh, based on the, the, uh, the, the, the Jacquard index. Right? So we have a network that is entirely unfiltered where all edges, even the very weak ones, are included. And then at the, the 0 0.90 uh, level, it essentially means that we only allow very, very strong friendship edges to be included in the, in the uh, uh, assortativity analysis. And what you see is that the correlation is actually uh, 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 quite high, right? You'd see that at, 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 at most thresholds, we have a correlation of about 0 0.55, both for the, uh, for the uh, pairwise assortativity as well as for the neighborhood assortativity. And you have to ask why that would be the case, right? And especially for negative users. So I mean, am I to believe that there's groups of users online that are very dour and very negative and they're hanging out together in sort of like a little goth circle? You know, they've got like the black mascara on and they're, I, that's kind of how I envision those, those groups. Uh, but, but, but it's a very strong, it's a very strong homophily, right? And, and if, you, if you plot it, of course, we, I, I like colorful heat maps. Uh, you, you can actually see these two groups, right? I mean, the, the, if you uh, remember the, the distribution that, that, that you just commented on, you know, the, sort of that bimodal distribution, you can clearly see this in this graph. So this is the, uh, uh, the source of an edge. So the way that they're organized, you get the user subjective well-being and then either their neighborhood or the other edge that they're connected to. So one of them is uh, the, the ones below here that's pairwise and on top is, is neighborhood assortativity. And you can clearly see that there's essentially two clusters of of, 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 of users uh, that, that seem to display very strong homophily with respect to mood. Now, th the one thing I want to add here is that we don't know whether this is because of contagion or preferential attachment. So when I go on Twitter and I hook up to uh, a, a, a very happy individual, does that make me happy? So that when Bowling comes around and analyzes the Twitter network, he, he, he observes homophily? Or is it that I choose my connections based on mood? That we haven't been able to separate out, and that's exactly the research project that we're working on right now, where we're actually looking at sad users and, 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 and looking at whether they become happier when their friends get happy, and vice versa. And you can already see in terms of public health, there could be some really interesting applications there. Right? And that's something we're working on right now. Uh, yeah, perhaps I, I've, I've already been talking perhaps too long, but here we actually found the most depressed user in the world. It's the uh, blue dot right there, surrounded by a whole bunch of other blue dots. And you know, I often think I should, I should send him a message <laughs> or, 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 or her a message go, come on, man, come on. It's not that bad. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've, got, I've got a lot of my DJ sets recorded. You know, perhaps I should send him a link going, I'll listen to this, I'll cheer you up. Okay so, okay, so that's one application. And this is, I know this is pretty superficial, but I didn't quite know how many of you were sort of, you know, sort of the leading experts in the domain of detecting homophily in social networks. So, but, um, I'm, I'm happy to give you more details after my talk and refer you to some public, other publications of ours that do this. Now, market prediction. So yeah, th th this paper has a really funny story. So uh, my, my student, Huina Mao, had a, uh, a, a Twitter data set. And uh, just as in data science, right, you, you're thinking, oh, this is really nice data. Let's see what we can do with this. And I was very interested in, in public sentiment. And um, so I, I, what I advised her to do is run the sentiment analysis that we had. Uh, over all of these users and, um, and see what we found. We used a psychological model here, a six-dimensional psychological model, so it's not binary affect, so it's not just positive, negative. It actually measures uh, uh, mood in, in, in those tweets along six psychological dimensions. Right? So we have about 10 million tweets from 2008 to 2000, uh, August 2008 to December 2008. Again, these are the tweets. I'm not going to go into this. The, we're using uh, the profile of mood states test, which is a test that's been used in psychology quite a bit for athletes when they train. Right? And it's, it's focused on pathological states mostly. But there's a bipolar one that also measures not pathological states but positive states. And we're measuring um, uh, the six dimensions, calm, alert, sure, vital, kind, happy. It's a lexicon-based approach, essentially, but we spiffed it up with the uh, negation detection and a whole bunch of other grammatical uh, tricks that, that I can't... I, I, I'm referring to ancient magic, which is something in role-playing games that people usually refer to uh, when something big happens. Uh, but I will say that the tool is now... Uh, uh, we, we actually obtained a patent for the tool, and my startup actually has an exclusive license, so I can't go into the too, much, uh, too many of the details except that, to tell you that it's, it works great. Um, Measures these six dimensions, calm, alert, sure, vital, kind, and happy, right? And uh, a tweet goes in, 
I am so not bored, way too busy, I feel really great. It, it actually deals with slang quite well because it's based on actual on internet data. It's, 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 uh, and uh, so you get a, a rating. And what this rating tells you is that this is a pretty energetic and elated uh, tweet and also a little friendly. Right? That's essentially what the tool does. The nice thing about this is that it's really geared towards detecting the mood state of the author rather than just the author telling you that they like Coca-Cola, they like Obama, or they like McCain. It's really uh, trying to measure how the author of that tweet is feeling along the six dimensions at that particular point in time. So again, this is perhaps a little, the, 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 the actual approach is very simple. You have a Twitter feed, you hook it up to the Twitter API, you pass it through that magical tool that I just told you about, and out, out come six, uh, six ratings, you have a six dimensional rating of those tweets, right? So you get something like this. And uh, I'll, I'll zoom in on a little bit. You've got these squiggly lines. It looks like an electrocardiogram for the entire community. So the, the, this was unfiltered. This is just the world. But in those days, it, that meant mostly the US. And the tool is ba at that point was focused on the English language anyway. So it's mostly the, the US or the Commonwealth. And what you can see very clearly is that you've got these big spikes. Right? Uh, spikes right? Here's the election, by the way. This is when Obama got elected. And here we've got Thanksgiving. Right? You can see how sort of average mood after the election start to, to, to slouch a little bit. You know, people were a little more confused. Uh, you can also see how um, uh, hostility uh, decreased tremendously after the election. Right? There's actually a point in that year where we, see, we saw both energy and hostility peak. And those are always dangerous moments. Even for psychiatric patients, that's, that's not a good state to be in. I mean, being very hostile and depressed at the same time and energetic, not good. So anyway, when we zoom in a little bit, you can clearly see that the, the tool managed to detect sort of the pre-election anxiety right there, that it, uh, uh, that it uh, measured, uh, where is energy, right there, that measured sort of high pre-election energy. This is probably the people going on saying, yes, we can, let's do it, you know. Uh, and a high degree of elation the day after the election. So along the six dimensions, it's really picking up on sort of the, the, the finer facets. The problem, is, the problem with these results is we could not get them published. Could not. I mean, I can't tell you how many submissions we made, and the reviewers coming back and so what? You've got a few squiggly lines, you know. Nobody cares about your lines, Boland. Uh, that, 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 was, that was essentially, no, really, I kid you not, those were mostly the reviews that we were getting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What is that? Yeah, I wish we could have predicted that in those negative reviews. I'm afraid I can't turn the, that science uh, around yet. Uh, you can seriously also the topics we did. So this is just TFIDF ranking of the, of, of, of the terms, right? And you could clearly see how the day before the election, you've got a lot of anxiety here, you know, socialist, grandmother, race, and then the day of the election, Joe the plumber, Pull, uh, you know, shows up. I don't know how many of you remember this. And then there's a historical speech because Obama won, you know. So you can see how, we, how the, the, the sentiment was driven by the topics. Okay, now, Thanksgiving, as you can see, a lot of elation, but flat line across the board, right? And that's probably because of eating too much turkey. Uh, I won't go into this. I mean, we actually set up a tool, clearly, where you can monitor the world's mood state along these uh, six dimensions, but clearly it only works for countries in which a lot of English was spoken. But we have since translated the tool to, 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 China, uh, to Mandarin, sorry, and a number of other languages. Okay, now, here comes the point, market prediction, okay? So I, t I tell my student, I tell my student, well, we can't get this published. We have to correlate this to something real, something real. And I remember that in 2008, I lost 50% of my retirement savings, and it made me very sad. So I figured if our measurements are valid, they must be correlated to movements of the stock market. I, I thought it was a reasonable assumption. So I tell my student, why don't, you, why don't you correlate the two? Just look at these six dimensions and correlate them to the, the, uh, the fluctuations of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Right? So again, same results here that you can see. And uh, I won't go into uh, this too much, but that's essentially where we're comparing the correlations between these dimensions. If they're more or less orthogonal, if they're measuring different mood, they shouldn't be correlated too much, and they weren't. But uh, our happy mood did correlate quite well with Opinion Finder. Uh, which we, you would expect because it's a binary positive negative sentiment tool. Okay, so the Dow, so you remember, I don't have a pointer, but I, I, most of you had any money in the markets remembered that fall. And it was very, very unpleasant. I had a colleague who was, oh, is it the stick? Yes. I was expecting to find some kind of sophisticated laser thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, great. Is this also used to cane the audience if they if they're inattentive? Okay. <laughs> So, so, so the, we, I mean, it's a huge drop, right? I mean, it's from the 13,000 to 8,000 and lower, right? So it made people very unhappy. So it was natural to believe that we could find some correlation. I'm going to put that here. Um, now, so, okay, so here's the, techno the, the methodology that we used in the paper, at least. And, I mean, you could disagree, but I, I want to stress one thing, though. All of, these, all of these methods are diagnostic in nature. We're not doing this to, to uh, we're doing this to determine whether our mood signal has predictive value with respect to the Dow Jones Industrial Average closing values. Right? It's not necessarily to, to make any claims about being able to, uh, uh, to predict the stock market and go live on a Caribbean island. So here's what we did. We took the Dow. Let me get this, the stick out again. So we took the, uh, uh, the, uh, we, we took the Dow, calculated the day-over-day -day difference, so the returns, took Twitter feed, performed our text analysis along the six dimensions, and then we did two things. Then we did a, a Granger causality analysis, which shows a way of calculating, well, I would say it's sort of a regression analysis, but based on different lags. And the assumption, of course, is that one time series causes fluctuations in the other if the fluctuations in one is, uh, usually precede fluctuations in the other. So it's called causality. It, it, I, I don't, it's one of my pet peeves, you know, people saying correlation is not, I, we all know that, but, you know, if you've got a lot of correlation, that's usually that's an indication that something's going on. So anyway, so you've got Granger causality, and then we did one more thing, and that's because this is ba largely based on, well, on linear regression, and these time series are anything but, uh, 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 sort of, these relations between these time series are, are anything but linear. And so we trained a, a self-organizing fuzzy neural network of most of the data for that year, Right, and then uh, included in that training uh, information that we, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fluctuations, right, and then we for, for, for the tr for the testing period, which is about the last month of the data that we had, we we determined we looked at how well the self-organizing fuzzy neural network could predict fluctuations in, in the Dow. Right? And so we measured the uh, the mean average percentage uh, error and then the direction percentage uh, correctness of this. Now. So here's, here are the data sets. You can see that the testing period is quite short, but we just needed enough training data to, to do this with. And what did we find? Okay, so first, the, uh, the Granger causality analysis. What we found is that, that public calmness, as measured on Twitter, so one of our mood dimensions, uh, uh, does a pretty good job at, um, at predicting, uh, at Granger causing fluctuations in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is, which is very interesting. Um, there's sort of a marginal effect for happy as well, but it's not all that strong. Uh, even if you look at the time series, but I've just eyeballed them, which I always tell my students to do, just eyeball the, the time series, that helps a lot, even though that, that, that does not constitute proof or statistical inference, you can clearly see how strongly they overlap over time. So the, the red line, the red line at the bottom is the calm mood, and it's a z-score calculated in a sliding window, right, to, to, to normalize the scale a little bit. And the blue line is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Same thing, these are the returns. And we overlaid one time series with the other. Uh, but the, the red time series, our calmness, has actually shifted in, forward in time by three days. Because that's where we, we saw a pretty strong effect. And you can see that the correlation between these time series is, is, is very, very strong. And again, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm apparently too short, to, even with the stick, to point out the... So if you look at the... If you look at the commas, for example, make it, taking this dive here, right, and then recovering, right, and this little spike here, you have to remember that that little spike of commas right there on the red line happened three days before the Dow actually moved up. Um, the, as you can imagine, this result got a lot of people, people's, uh, how to say it, knickers in a knot, um, because we thought the effect would be the opposite, you know, that fluctuations in the Dow would make everybody really sad or anxious. And that it would work the other way, but it didn't. The, the one thing that got, even, that got people really riled up and really kind of regret that the, the, the value is what it is, um, but that's when we looked at the direction percentage. So that's when we just counted how often the self-organizing fuzzy neural network correctly predicted whether the, the Dow would be, the return would be up versus down. And it was, it was correct 86.7% of the time over that testing period. Okay. Now, the testing period was pretty short, but we've repeated this analysis uh, in my startup and in, in our research, um, and we found very similar effects to all of this. I mean, this is a, a 2011 
fall of 2011, uh, a period of very high volatility, and again, you could see that the, these time series are very well correlated. And again, the, 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 uh, the red line, that's our mood state, has been shifted forward in time by, by three days. Right? Matches very well. We actually had a hedge fund use this for, uh, for a, a pretty straightforward uh, uh, sort of buy-sell strategy, and uh, they did very well. Um, um, so anyway, if you, if you want more papers about sort of financial, how am I doing on time? Am I? Oh, wow. Okay, so the, here's some papers of, that, that we published recently. My, my student has actually been, Twitter's one thing, but we've been trying to unravel sort of all of the different effects between these different social media feeds. So my student has actually been looking at uh, uh, comparing search engine data. For example, a lot of people on, on, on Google, in Google Trends, right, they search for bearish versus bullish. So for every day or every moment in time, well, every week really, it's weekly data, you can calculate sort of a bearish, bullish ratio just by looking at searches for, for those two, two words, bearish, bullish. And again, that seems to be highly predictive of, uh, of uh, market data. She, she, she actually, you can do it by region, for, do it for the UK, for America, look at the particular indexes in those countries, and we found very strong predictive effects on all levels. Um, the, the, the interesting thing, though, is that if you, if you survey investors, there's, there's published surveys of investors where they call traders or investors every morning and ask them whether they feel bullish or bearish, and th that has very little predictive value. So I still have to ask the question. These results are, you know, they are what they are, but why are we seeing this at all? Right? It's, it's one of those cases where you have an observation, but it's very difficult to explain. I mean, when investors are feeling bearish or bullish, it seems to have no predictive value with respect to... Uh, uh, local markets, uh, but the Twitter data and the Google Trend data does seem to have an effect. So, what, what, what does the crowd know that investors don't know? Um, a colleagues of ours at Indiana University have recently published a really interesting paper. They actually looked at where they they filtered the the Twitter feed according to whether people had a lot of followers versus very few followers, and they found that the the predictive effect is actually stronger when people have few followers than when they have lots of followers. So there must be some level of privileged information out there that has value and that's not being picked up somehow in the media or the information that most investors are aware of. Anyway, I should also give you a disclosure. I do have a startup. It's called GuideWave Consulting. And uh, that, that's actually running this analysis in real time and, and selling the results to, to, to hedge funds and, and banks. So uh, that, that's my, I'm the CEO of that. Of, of, I have to do this. This is a disclaimer, a disclosure. Otherwise, you think I'm, I'm trying to sell you on my... Uh, I stuff I'm not. Anyway, so a, a brief discussion, computational social science. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, I mean, we were talking before lunch, right, about this. In, in essence, as a psychologist, right, I'm, uh, what we're used to, we're, we're educated to put a bunch of graduate students in a, in, a, in a dark room and subject them to experiments, right, and call it a day. And I've got tremendous, I mean, it doesn't sound being flippant, but I've got tremendous respect for that tradition. Right? You've got a hypothesis and you're trying to reject it by an actual controlled experiment. Right? There's, there's tremendous value in that. But n nowadays we have the, the social media data which is available at a scale and a level, level of granularity and at a resolution that we've never had before. And you can even argue that a lot of experiments have already been conducted. The question is to take the data and to slice it up in a way j just so that, the, that you have established that the conditions have been set up naturally and then look at what happened. In history, the, the, for example, history suffered a lot from that. You can, you can argue in, uh, you know, until you're blue in the face about what caused the, the rise of the NSDAP in, in pre-war Germany, etc. But you can, never repeat, you can never do controlled experiment to see what would happen if, if you'd subject a population like that to, to other stressors, right? Uh, but nowadays, we, we, we kind of have that kind of international data. Now, it's not a controlled experiment, but it gets you pretty close. These are stuff that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Emotions and mood are even more, they're very private uh, factors. Most people will not, will, will, you know, when you put them in a room, you're doing a controlled experiment. Uh, social conformity bias will, will play an, a tremendous role. People don't seem to have those same limitations when they communicate in, in social media. I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes I'm really embarrassed when we read the tweets I do. I actually do read the tweets. Not all of them, but I take samples just to make sure the data is valid. And I, I'm really shocked at what people will actually put online. You know, I've, I've, I've had people in meetings with their bosses saying, my boss sucks, this meeting is so boring. And they put it on Facebook, knowing that their boss is actually on Facebook. and on I, Really amazing stuff. Um, 
future research, what I'm really interested in is understanding more of the causal pathways between this, right? And that's why we have all of this longitudinal data so we can track individual users over extended periods of time and seeing whether they, they undergo transitions and whether they undergo transitions collectively or individually and what the stressors and, and the factors are. You know, okay, science is, is about m modeling, right? But prediction, but not just about prediction. If you have prediction, you have to also be able to, to show that you can control the system, right? That's sort of the, the, the golden standard, right? And can we control large groups of people? So let's just say that you're the, the, you're the Russian government and you're really interested in, in, in quelling uh, social unrest in, in, in the Ukraine and the, 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 the Crimea, right? Could you have a Twitter campaign and, and try to pour some oil on those waves? Could you do that? That would be highly unethical. I'm not advocating for doing that. That would really offend me. Uh, but once you have this kind of prediction in place, once you understand how people are feeling and how they're acting and where they are, uh, I'm concerned that people will start using these kind of algorithms and this kind of analysis to, to exert social control. Anyway, here's a, a bunch of papers that they're all freely uh, available. Uh, if you go to my website, you'll, you'll find uh, 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 even more papers. Uh, you can reach me at this email address. I'd be more than happy to field any questions. Uh, hope this was interesting to you. Uh, that's it. There's no questions. Yes, sir. So I saw that some of the Twitter, the, some of the tweets you're looking at had you know, 140 words and other ones had seven or eight words. So how do you deal with that difference in sample size? Yeah, that's a really tough one. Uh, I mean, we're lo lucky there's, a, there's an upper limit because that, that, that provides some kind of an upper boundary. But yeah, when a tweet contains very little information, you have a choice whether to exclude it from your analysis or make sure that your, your mood measurement isn't being biased by the length of a tweet. I mean, recently, recently had a case where we were performing language detection and we had a whole bunch of tweets that scored very strongly on the probability of being English. It was because they, they contained only, just one correctly spelled English word. And then, yeah, I mean, it, 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 you do that on an ad hoc basis. But we do take it into account whenever we can because there's all kinds of effects. I mean, is, is a short tweet more terse than a longer tweet? Is that, is that a signal? We, talk, we talked about that before my presentation. It's actually really interesting because I'm, I'm very interested in sort of information theoretical measures of this, you know, how much information is actually being communicated, right? And if, if people use more words, does it mean that these, so the overall, I, I don't know what you call the information density of the tweet is lower than if it's just got a few sort of terse statements? So that's a very interesting research topic, actually. You're retreating this is sort of one big tech stream, and, and there's so many dynamics inside, retweeting and um, many people repeating some yes. particularly strong statement or something. So um, do you average out that somehow, or no, you count that as? Well, in, in, in the results that I just described to you, no, we did not. We did just averaged it out. But right now I'm involved in a research project where we're actually looking at sort of, I mean, it's, you could compare it to sort of finding spectral lines in the, in the mood distribution. I mean, clearly if Obama wins the election, that makes the Democrats on Twitter very happy. It makes the Republicans very sad. Right? And so you can actually use that kind of mood information to trace whether there's sort of communities of understanding, you know, people who feel very, uh, who feel differently about these kind of events. Like, um, if, for example, there's an earthquake, right? Very cynically speaking, most people will look at an earthquake disaster as a bad thing. But if you're in the construction sector and, and you're speculating that, that commodity prices will go up, that might make you very happy. So we do take into account sort of these, these the, one, the sort of the, these, uh, the degree to which different communities respond differently to events and to develop different collective mood states. And in addition, uh, we do look at these kind of cascades. Like I'm, I'm interested, for example, in using Twitter to measure uh, scientific impact. That's something that, uh, an interest that I share with Michael among scientists, right? And a lot of, I've seen this, you know, you post a paper on Twitter, some papers really, there's a cascade, people retweeting the reference to the paper, saying this is a really cool paper, everybody should read that. Right, it's sort of the, the, the R0 of that, that virus, if, you know, is that an indicator of the quality of the paper, of, of, its, of its potential to generate a lot of attention? Right? Yeah, so we do take those into account. 
But it just depends on the research question that you're trying to, to, to answer. Clearly, when, for, for, for something, if you just count the total number of tweets or retweets, you're measuring sort of how many eyeballs that the subject has captured. You're not measuring much more of interest. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Sure. Uh, so, like, I, I don't know the psychology of literature very well, nor its lingo, uh, but for instance, there's, uh, I think it's a pretty famous study about happiness. So, uh, they have a, the researchers have a random sample of people, they ask them how happy they are using the kind of question that you asked, right. uh, but to a random subsample of them, they, uh, or, or to everyone, they, to all members of the, the study, they ask them to make a copy before they're asked this question about happiness. All of them are asked to make a copy using a copy machine. But to a random subsample of them, half of them find a dime in in the copy machine, and and like that makes their day because like gosh, they found a dime, and now they're, the copy that they were asked to make is free. Right. And what researchers found was that the happiness that they reported was statistically significant higher, statistically significantly higher than it was for the sample who didn't receive the ten cents. And so you might, so if you were to believe that, which is ridiculous because that's like doesn't constitute a wealth effect or anything. Uh, so if you were to believe, moreover, that like people on Twitter just tend to like tweet only whenever like these like trivial things happen to them, like you'd find that there's like and, and as a researcher you're actually interested in their underlying well-being and not just like this random shit that happens to them. You might then believe that I, like Twitter is <laughs> not that useful. So I'm kind of wondering, okay. do you think of that? Yeah, no, but I, I will say this. I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's really difficult to draw a distinction between whether I'm happy because of random shit happening to me or whether I'm happy. I, I, I don't know how you can answer a question like that. I, I understand the distinction that you're drawing, right? I mean, I think in this kind of research, a lot of people draw a distinction between exogenous and endogenous mood, right? I mean, if someone walks up to me and kicks me, that will make me unhappy. Right? Does that mean I'm an unhappy fellow? No, I just got kicked. Of course I'm unhappy. It's a response to an event, right? Um, but... In, in our mood test, in our algorithms, we, we specifically are not, we're specifically looking at endogenous mood. I mean, we attempt. I don't know how well we succeed, but we look at mood that is sort of stable over a, a, sort of a more extended period of time, and that is not tied to a particular topic. So when someone goes on Twitter and says, I found a dime, now I'm happy. Yeah, I mean, that, inf that kind of information can be discarded. We're looking at sort of more stable indicators of, of mood. That's why, for example, in that, that one where we're looking at a, uh, the, the research where we looked at homophily, we, we studied people for, for six months of, of time, right? So they could have found a dime on, on, on day one. I don't think that's a very long-lasting effect. But I understand the distinction. It's a sort of endogenous versus ex exogenous mood. There's, the, the other perspective is social here. And that's, what, that's where collective mood states come to be. So let's just say we all have a shared experience. Right? So we're, we all lose our jobs. Right? Well, that will make us unhappy. But is that, is that, is that really collective mood? No, it's, it's, it's a reflection of the circumstances. We just lost our jobs, of course we're unhappy. That's, not, uh, that's, that's what I call exogenous mood. But let's just say that we, we know you lost your job and we, we factor that out of our measurement somehow by, you know, by sampling, etc. And we notice that for some reason, you know, I, I'm, I, I get depressed and you get depressed because I'm depressed. And before you know, we don't even know why we're depressed anymore. That's sort of, that comes a lot closer to endogenous mood. Of, 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 and we have research projects that specifically try to draw that distinction. By, uh, for example, if you have an event, there's an earthquake. You know that all of the negative, well, the negative tweets that you're seeing are because of the earthquake. Now we can use that as a baseline to measure endogenous mood. So there's a lot of work still to be done. <laughs> no must. <laughs> <laughs>